Good morning. Welcome this morning. Last week, if you were here, you remember I was standing back over there and the video announcements began and it was me on the video. You remember that? It's my understanding, I, I'm not going to tell you who told me this, but there was a comment made behind this person when the video came on and they saw me standing over there and they said, oh good lord, there's two of them. <laughs> that person, that person was not revealed to me who said that, however, I understand. With that in mind, this morning, our video announcements are by somebody a lot more talented and a lot better looking than me. <laughs> Happy Sunday, everyone. We are so excited to have you here worshiping with us, um, both in person and online. If you are in person with us, please grab one of the white Connect cards in the pew in front of you. Uh, just fill it out legibly, front and back, and drop that into the offering basket later in the service. So coming up next Sunday, July 8th, is going to be our church potluck. The church is going to be providing hamburgers and hot dogs, but if you would like to bring a dish for everyone to share, as well as a friend, we would love to see you. It's going to be a really great time, and who knows, maybe even around a kickball might start up. So please come and join us for the fun and fellowship. Giving statements are going to be going out this week, so please make sure to check those, and if you have any issues, please contact the church office. Also coming up is the school supplies for Sug Middle School. They're going to be collected the entire month of July, so please see the list in your bulletin and bring those in as soon as you can. Um, the list is also available on the link as well, so get those in. And also, the church office is going to be closed on July 4th, so enjoy your 4th of July. I know that all of the staff will, and I hope you have a wonderful holiday. Well, I think that's all I have. If you want to stay connected to all of the exciting things going on here at Trinity, please follow us online and on our social media at Trinity Bradenton, and I hope you have a wonderful Sunday. The Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, rejoice. The Lord is near. Let's pray. Lord, today we recall your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day that you are with us in each moment. Thank you that your promises are true and your goodness never fails us. In these moments, we come to you and we lay our lives before you, Lord. May we worship and adore you with every fiber of our being. May everything within us cry, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And so today, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord from generations past and present, and with all the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness and beauty. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Lord, you are so precious to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Wow. We are blessed. Charles Wesley wrote our first hymn. He was number 18 of 19 children. And one thing I found out this week was that when he was born, he was premature. And for weeks, he lay wrapped in a woolen blanket, very unresponsive. And one author said they weren't sure he was going to make it. But he did, and in his lifetime, he wrote 8,989 hymns. He wrote all of these after his conversion. And he grew up in a very strict, uh, devout, religious home. And, but he and John both felt like something was missing. Something was missing. They went to, you know, they went to their father's church every Sunday. They had a mother who taught them for six hours a day about religion. And they had grown up with a very strong faith, but not a personal relationship with God. And so after both of them were converted in later years, he wrote so many of these hymns. And they said that his hymns and the singing of these hymns was a powerful part of the Methodist movement and that it strengthened it. And they talked about the early Methodist singing. Uh, one author said that they sang so well that you could always recognize Methodist singing. They sang with devotion and with serene hearts and with charm. And this hymn is probably one of the top five hymns that he wrote. Love divine, all loves excelling. And it kind of talks about his belief that you can be religious, you can come to church every Sunday, but until you recognize the love of Jesus and what he did for us, um, you really don't have a really good relationship and that that can strengthen your relationship. And this hymn says, love divine, it excels everything else. Everything else. So let's stand and sing this beautiful Wesley hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. <laughs> Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church. 
apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. seated this morning, turn and pass the peace of Christ to one another. The Yellow Rose this morning is in celebration of Bonnie Wilson, who turns 91 tomorrow. So happy birthday. The arrangement is given by David and Jenny Brown in loving memory of his parents, Henry and Mary Margaret Brown, and his brother, Henry Brown, Jr. Prayer requests. They're listed in your bulletin, and I remind you of these and ask you to uh, lift these folks up during uh, not only today, but the upcoming week. They are Chad Choate, Billy Dean, Laurie Fetzer, Kenny Hawkins Jr., Howard Longstreet, Jim Martin, Tina Ranke, Carolyn Reynolds, Carmen Russell, Sally Wallace, Pastor Matt's mother and Gloria Warren. And also remember to pray for those who do not yet know Jesus in our families, in our neighborhood, and our community. And I am sure we all have names, if not ourselves, names on our hearts this morning, and I would ask you to join together as the church as we lift those up in prayer. And with Independence Day coming up, pray for our country as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, we lift these on our prayer list as well as those that are on our hearts this morning up to you in this brief moment. All space and time are yours, O God, of all ages, and in your sight, all nations pass through times of peril. Now, when our land seems troubled 
be near to judge and save. May leaders be led by your wisdom. May they search your will and see it clearly. If we have turned from your way, help us, Lord. Convict us, reverse our ways, and re help us to repent. Give us your light and your truth to guide us. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray for America. Dear God, we thank you for giving us this great nation, for the freedom we enjoy, for the freedom found in you. It all comes from your mighty hand. We commit to honor you in all that we do. Where there is darkness, may we shine your light. Where there is conflict, please bring unity. Where there is hatred, may we bring your love. Where there is brokenness, please bring healing. Where there is fear, help us share your hope. This Independence Day, we declare our dependence on you if we humble ourselves and pray. Seek your face and turn from our sin. You will heal our land. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. For Ushers would come forward at this time. We'll receive this morning's offer. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we ask as we come to this time of offering that you would bless these, our tithes and offerings, through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of this world and our Savior. Amen.
I think this, the chorus of this next hymn is one that I learned as a kid, and you probably did too, many, many years ago. Uh, oh, how I love Jesus. Let's sing it with gusto, a serene heart, and charm. a cappella. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Our scripture today comes from 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, the 14th through the 19th verses, and we're reading from the New Living Translation. Either way, now this doesn't say this, but what Paul's talking about is whether I'm of sound mind or not of sound mind, either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. We died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jim. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your wonderful life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we this next week celebrate the 4th of July, we are so grateful that we live in a country, Father, that was founded on belief and trust in you, our Lord God. Father, today open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the things that you want to speak into us. 
And we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Well, it's an honor to be here with you again this morning. Just want to encourage you to please keep Pastor Matt and his family in prayer. Um, Sister Sally is in hospice. And at this time, um, they aren't sure if it would be hours or days before her transition into heaven. And so as you can imagine, this is just um, a challenging but celebrating time, as you know, uh, for the Wallace family. So let's continue to keep Pastor Matt uh, and his family in prayer. Jerry, I want to thank you this morning for you, for your life, for all that you do here. You're a good guy. Thanks for helping. Thank you. I know you could be sitting here, standing here doing what I'm doing this morning, and you are capable, and I'm, we just appreciate all that you and your lovely wife do. And I want to, I, I don't know about you, but I almost cried. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I don't know about you, but I was almost in, uh, Jerry, you looked a little choked up too. I, 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 I almost cried during Carolyn's. Isn't, isn't, wasn't that wonderful? We are so blessed, Carolyn. Where are you? Thank you. And Shelby, you know, I just, I'm not going to name names, but I hear some amazing voices somewhere behind me, and uh, I'm teasing, but yes, I did. I'm looking at some of you, yes. Listen, isn't it wonderful during the summer that we can have such a, a just a wonderful uh, choir in our traditional service, and, and you do so wonderfully with them, and I just want to invite some of you. Um, Maybe God is kind of urging you, speaking to you. If you would want to be a, a part of our choir, we would love to have you. They are such a blessing to us on Sunday morning. And so um, make a joyful noise, right? And Shelby, if, if they're just shower singers, it's fine, right? Just come. We'd love to have you. This morning um, is our final week in our series, Vital Lessons. And last week, I talked about how our faith costs something. Um, as believers, as Christ followers, Christians, you know, our lifestyle changes. It becomes pretty radical in comparison to the world. We're different. And uh, when you and I are living for Christ, and we're boldly living for Christ, um, and we're doing it and living life in the way that the Holy Spirit leads us, then we recognize that, you know, in expressing his love, we will at times face opposition. That's what we talked about last week. This morning, uh, I want to talk about how we can, listen, this is, this, this is going to be, I pray this is a life changer for all of us. We're going to be talking about how we can break the labels that bind us, the labels that hold us back, those things in our lives because someone in our past, um, somewhere, sometimes said something, did something, or called us something, somebody characterized us in some way that was not who we are and not who God is, is, is in us. And so we bought into it, and it holds us back. So maybe some of us have believed a lie about ourselves that isn't true, and we're living under the labels of our past. So, the very first thing I want to do this morning is I want to give you a couple names. Well, I'll start with the name of a well-known person who has a label attached to their name. You fill in the blank this morning. I just want to show you how, 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 how much we don't recognize this. Ready? Here we go. Winnie the... Thank you. Winnie the Pooh. I don't know about you, but I would not like to be called the Pooh. Okay. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. Here's another one. Billy the Kid. Here's one more. Ready? Popeye the Sailor Man. Yeah. Every one of these names, right, has a label attached to it. Now, not very many people know this, so you're my family, and I'm just going to tell you. When I was a kid... I had a label attached to me that actually was very hurtful. And I remember the neighborhood kids, you know, saying it and kind of into, into grade school. They used to call me Spot. So the neighborhood kids, when they saw me, they go, come on, Spot, here's Spot. Because 
I have a dime-sized birthmark on my chin. And it's a funny thing, you know? Caleb, we were kind of talking about things that kind of we don't recognize. It. I recognize this week. Do you know that in high school, I don't know about you, but we couldn't grow a beard in high school. You weren't allowed to do that. And some of us, including myself, couldn't grow a beard <laughs> until I was a senior. But as soon as I got out of high school and went to college, guess what I did? I grew a beard. And guess what I still have? And I thought about this week. Maybe I just ought to shave that off. You know, labels. I was Rick the Spot. And that was, you know, as a child, that was no fun. And so it was embarrassing. It was shameful. And, uh, but I, I grew through it. And it changed. And, you know, I don't know. I'm going to reference. Anybody ever seen the movie The Man in the Mask with Leonardo DiCaprio? You're allowed to raise your hands because you're allowed to watch movies in church. Okay. So those of you that ever watched this movie, this is a reference to that. But it's, a, it's, it's true. You know what? The spot doesn't wear me. I wear the spot. And here's the thing. This morning, I'd la like to ask you all to think about something. I, and, and this is what I want you to think about. What is the negative name or label that follows you? What is the negative label that might be following you? At first this week when, I, you know, when Pastor Matt actually told me Thursday, so, you know, I don't think I, I'm going to be able to be here. And so, as I was just thinking through this, I realized something. I thought, you know, I wonder how many people, you know, have labels or maybe even recognize, and maybe this is just a few. Check this out, because as you know, I like to go on the internet, and I like statistics. Did you know that, that, eight, that in a poll right here in Western culture America, 85, listen, 85% of people admit that they have some kind of, 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 of situation where they suffer in their lives with low self-esteem. Because somebody told them something or said you are something and they could not get past it. So, this morning, maybe somebody's called you stupid. You know, I had a friend that people called that person fat. Oh, she's fatty. Hi, fatty. Can you imagine? You know, kids, you know, can be cruel, you know, or stupid, or, you know. And so this person, you know, shared with people that I was called fat all my life. And so I just said, well, I guess I'm fat. And they finally came to a point in their lives where they realized, wait a minute, I don't have to be that, do I? And so they lost weight, and they were no longer that. You know, so some of you this morning may have been called worthless, irresponsible, hothead, whatever it is. You know, my dad, you know, his dad told him he would never make anything out of himself. My dad was raised on a farm, farm boy, went to Bowling Green State University in Ohio for one year, met my mom, and they got married, and he was out. But here's the in interesting thing about my dad. Um, he went back to my hometown, Piqua, Ohio. Who's ever heard of Piqua, Ohio? No way. Seriously? You really have? Let me see your hands again. Oh, I love you guys. <laughs> like nobody's ever heard of Piqua. Okay. Um, and, he, and my dad started working in, in, a, in, a, in a machinery company, in, you know, working on a machine. And he, he just kept working his way up. And he was loved architect, and he began to design some sugar presses and whatever. And by the time, you know, he was you know, 15 years into it, he was like the vice president of the company. And uh, later in my college years, my dad moved from Ohio to Florida, which is why I'm here, and he was the vice president of the United States Sugar Corporation. He was the only executive in that company, in the history of that company, that had a position like that who did not have a degree. And so, you know, my dad was, you'll never make anything out of yourself. One of the things I remember, and how many of you know as parents, we sometimes say, say things and we think, oh, I wish I never did that. And I love my mom and dad. But I remember my dad always said something to me, and it stuck with me. He said, don't touch that, you'll break it. Don't touch that, you'll break it. Some of us can remember things like that. 
And here's the thing this morning. I want you to take a moment. And I want you to listen to what God's word says about you. Not through the lens of any label, or any words that have been spoken to you or put on you that you've bought into or even things that you tell yourself. I want you to listen carefully through the eyes of God. And here's what I pray that you're going to hear. I pray that you're going to hear that God's power is always greater than your past. God's power is always bigger, greater than your past. God's opinion of you is greater than any current truth in your life that you may be telling you or someone else is telling you. So even if you own a label this morning, okay, everybody understands what I'm saying, that you, that you deserve. Oh yeah, <laughs> let me tell you, please hear this and understand that what's true about you doesn't have to be true about you tomorrow. What's true about you today that you have labeled yourself or someone else doesn't have to be that way tomorrow. And so the Spirit of God is wanting to speak to all of us this morning because, it, you know, based on the 85%, you know, that means that the majority, the high majority of everyone in here, in some way, is, is struggling, maybe secretly or not so secretly, with low self-esteem and, and working on something. And your spouse, or if you had a spouse, or your friend, or whoever, is maybe just kind of going to you little nudge this morning. And so this morning, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to speak to all of us because he wants to empower all of us to break every label that might be holding us back and giving us a God-centered view of ourselves based on his word. And it says this, anyone, everybody say anyone, anyone, who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life life has begun. So anyone this morning, anyone who belongs to Christ, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, it doesn't matter how bad your past is or how true the label is about you, it doesn't matter who you are, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Folks, I mean, if that's not good news, I do not know what is. This morning is not supposed to be a motivational seminar. You know, church isn't that. Sometimes it, it, it pumps us up. Sometimes it encourages us. Sometimes it challenges us. This morning, I hope you're challenged. I hope you're encouraged. But this is the truth. This is the word of God. You are who God says you are. You are not who anyone else says you are. Even yourself. This morning, you need to understand that your past has been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Anything that's hold you hostage doesn't need to hold you anymore. So I want to give you three thoughts today before we receive communion. Three thoughts that I believe will help you this morning and set you free from whatever, whatever labels that you might have held in your life and in your heart. The first one is this. You ready? Number one, God, through the power of Christ, will give you a new name. God, through the power of Christ, will give you a new name. In Isaiah 62.2, it says this, you will be called by a new name, that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. See, I love the mirroring of the Old Testament you know, to the New Testament. It's a, it's, it's a forecast. This is what Christ you know, has done in, in our lives. Many Christians are held back by the words that were spoken to them. Things that were unloving and shaming at times. They bought into the lie that says, you don't just make mistakes, you are a mistake. No, that is not true. That is not true. My, ga- my dad and the things that he said to me, he didn't mean that, he just wasn't, Sure, he he just didn't know how that would affect me. Some of us have maybe done that with our children. And maybe this morning, some of you here will recognize some things you've said. And if you do, and if the Holy Spirit does prompt you to do that, don't hesitate for one moment to get on the phone and say, you know what? I remember when I was a younger parent, 
that I might have said something that might have hurt your feelings, and I want to go back and change that because I just, I didn't, I didn't realize it. You don't just make mistakes. <laughs> you are a mistake. You know, just because you fail doesn't mean you're a failure. Can I say that again? Just because you fail does not mean you're a failure. You know, um, any education majors in college and teachers, do you remember, any of you, I remember my first or second year in college, I took a class because I, I minored in, in music education. And I remember taking a class, and I'd take a psychology class, you know, because it's part of what you have to do, but this one particularly, I remember, they came, there was a term called self-fulfilled prophecy. How many of you know what that is? And it was interesting because they were talking about how it affects children in the classroom. And it's defined as this. It's a prediction that directly or indirectly causes itself to become true by the very terms of the prophecy itself due to positive feedback between belief and behavior. That means if you tell a child that they're stupid or you tell a child that they're not good enough or they're fat or they're skinny, they will begin to believe it and they will begin to live it out. You know, words are powerful. You know, we talked about that before. Our words in the Old Testament, it says, you know what, there's life and death in the power of the words. You've got to be careful. Let me tell you, when you're at a stoplight and somebody does something in the next car and you're not happy, watch what you say because the curses and the words you speak to them, they mean something because words have power. So what the Bible says. So when you're looking at yourself in your mirror, if you look at yourself in the mirror and you tell yourself, I'm never, gonna, I'm never going to do this. I'm never going to... You know, watch that because your words are powerful. Watch what you say. Our Lord will bestow upon you a new name. So he replaces your old title, right? Your old label with a new name. How many of you are excited about that? Okay, just me. I'll ask again. How many of you are excited about that? Yes! If you are, say amen. Absolutely, because we are new creations in Christ. There's nothing like that out. The world offers nothing like that, does it? I'm telling you, it's amazing. So he replaces your old title, your old label, gives you a new name. You know, and God's done this so many times, far too many for me to even go into this morning. But I'm going to just give you two or three examples of this. Abraham and Sarai. How many of you know who they are? Who later became Abraham and Sarah, right? They wanted to have, more than anything, they wanted to have children. You know what? I mean, he was 100 and she was 90. How many of you know that's probably not going to happen? You're not, you're not going to have children. You have, you have, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> you have passed your time. But yet, through the miracle of God, they, they, they did. It was wonderful. They had Jacob. Or I mean, excuse me, they had Isaac. And the amazing thing is that God said to them, you know what? You're no longer Abram and Sarai. I'm going to call you Abraham and Sarah. He says, your, na your new name means this. It means father and mother of many nations. Amazing. Jacob, you know what that name means? Swindler. <laughs> Trickster. Wow. My first name is James. Any Jameses is here? Jim, you don't have to raise your head. I'm James. I'm James Richard. You know, and James is the same meaning as Jacob. Um, and yet God gave him a new name. You know what his name means? The new name? You know, so Jacob, who means swindler or trickster, and God said to him, I'll give you a new name, Israel, which means this, you have wrestled with God and you will prevail, or God will prevail. You know, he changed his name. Gideon. Now, how many of you know anything about Gideon? Gideon was pretty much a wuss, sorry. He was a coward. You know, he was hiding out. He was in, in, you know, he was in a cave and his enemies were looking for him. And God sent an angel who said to this, the Lord is mighty with you. And so you are a mighty man of valor. And God literally called him mighty warrior. See, God will give you a new name. See, the things that you've been labeled with in your past will no longer be true. I have seen this in my life. I have seen this in my life. Anybody else? I have seen this in my life. Nobody here has seen this in your life. Let me, let, me, let me encourage you this morning. You can respond. You can raise your hand. It's okay to do that. And here's the thing. 
You may feel unworthy. You may you know, find yourself thinking, if not saying, I'm just not good enough. I'm just not there yet. But God will help you. He'll help you into your new name. He'll help you to know who you are in him. Some of you, God is going to give a new name, forgiven. Because you've not grasped that. And so, you know, he's going to let you know that you are forgiven. Some of you, God's going to give the name maybe, um, I don't know, loved. Maybe you struggle with feeling loved. And, and let me tell you, folks, if you don't love yourself, you have a hard time loving God and loving others. And the first two things God said are the most important is to love the Lord thy God and love others. Biggest lesson I've ever learned in my life is, is, is and I'm still learning it, is, is that God loves me. And so if God loves me, why wouldn't I love me? And everybody said? And this big, big, big thing. So some of you, you are forgiven. You know, you, you, you need the revelation that your sins have been, you know, spread apart from as far as the east is from the west. You're forgiven. You're cleansed by the blood of Christ. For some, maybe God is going to call you overcomer because your whole life, somebody says, you'll never be able to do that. You'll never overcome this. You'll never be able to lose it. You'll never be able to, you'll, you're too skinny. You're too this. You're too that. You're inadequate. You're, you know, you just don't measure up. And God is saying, no, no, you are not what others have said that you are. You are what I say you are. And so God will grow you into the name that he gives you. The second thing is God will give you a new purpose. Hmm. Ephesians 1.11 says this. We have also received an inheritance in Christ. We were destined by the plan of God who accomplishes everything according to his design. See, with your new name comes a new purpose. With your new name always comes a new purpose. And again and again, we see God doing this over and over in the Bible. Let me give you a couple. Simon, you know, he, he could have been labeled, you know, uh, irresponsible, unpredictable, undependable. Simon, wishy-washy. And Jesus meets Simon and, and his, some of his guys, and he was out fishing. And he says, you're a fisherman, but you know what? You've been fishing for fish. I'm going to change your name. Now, you're going to be fishing for men. And so, you know, for the rest of your life, you know, Lay down your fishing pole and you're going to go after people. That's who you're going to catch now for Christ. And along with that new purpose came the new name, a new identity. You know, one time Jesus asked Simon, hey, who do people say that I am? And people says, well, some people say you're this, so, so, and so, this, that, and the other. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're John the Baptist. And Jesus looked him straight in the, in the eyes and said, you know, who do you say I am? And Simon said, I say that you are Christ, son of Of the living God. And then we see in Matthew 16, Jesus went on to say, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but but my Father in heaven. And listen to this I tell you, Simon, I'm giving you a new name. Your name is now Peter, the rock, Petra. And he says, You know, you are no longer undependable, irresponsible, but you are the rock. And on the rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And most all of us know, in fact, that Peter actually denied Jesus not only once or twice, but three times in the garden. But after the resurrection, Jesus graciously forgave him, restored him, and said, hey, Peter, the rock, Go on now and do what I have created you to do. Be who I have created you to be. Because you're, no, you're not Simon the fisherman. You are Peter the rock. And then we, we realize that on the day of Pentecost, Peter the rock, the one who knew what it was like to fail and fall, can you imagine denying Christ? How do you think, oh, the, just the shame that he must have experienced But yet Jesus saw that he is best qualified, Peter, the rock, to stand up and say, repent, sinners. Turn to Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And Peter, the rock, led 3,000 people to Christ. You know, and as a result, the beginning of the New Testament church was formed on, not Simon, but the guy with the new name, Peter, the rock. And this morning, I want to encourage you. See, God has given you a new name. And with that comes a new purpose. But here's the thing. It's our choice. 
It's your and my choice, our responsibility to grow into that purpose. So whatever negative label, you know, whatever has been associated with your name that from p- the past and you hold on to it, let go. Understand that through the power of Christ and out of the greatest weakness of your past, your greatest strength will come. Jesus said, I, I've come to make all things new. So out of my and your greatest weaknesses, God has birthed our greatest strength. Here's the third and final one. God will give you a new future. One of my favorite scriptures of all time is Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, I've got this on my wall at home, and many of you know this. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So what has God given us? A Hope and a future. Hmm. See, so many of us in the body of Christ don't realize how pessimistic we are about our future. My life is not going anywhere. You know, I'm never going to be able to do this. I'm I'm not good enough to do that. I'm I'm never going to be happy. I'm always going to be alone. I'm I'm, I'm always going to be miserable. I'm never going to get out of debt. I'm never going to get married, you know. And maybe you've been labeled and you feel like, you know, I hate to say this, always the bridesmaid but never the bride. That concept of why everybody else? What's, what about me? What about me, God? See, God has plans for you. That's the big takeaway this morning. You are not who people said you are. You are even not sometimes who you think you are. But if you can, if you can grasp and let the Spirit of God, get into your spirit and into your soul, your mind, your will and emotions and recognize who you are. It's a, it, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. God has plans. Hope in a future. Out of your weakness, out of the past, the labels, God's gonna raise up and wants to raise up strength, give you hope, he gives you a future. You know, let me close with this story. One of the best stories in the Bible tells of a lady. You'll know who it is in just a moment. (laughs) This lady was probably given one of the worst labels you can imagine. Her name is mentioned eight times in the Bible. Six of those times, the negative label is attached to her name. She was known as Rahab. And you know who Rahab, Rahab is. She is what's called Rahab the, the harlot, Rahab the prostitute, whatever. If you do, and and, and you get into the history, the context of this surrounding her life, that during her culture and where she lived and when she lived, there were two types of women who were in her business. You know, one type, and this is the truth, was more respectable, and the other type was horribly not respected. And they were the lowest of the lowest. Well, Rahab was the lowest of the lowest. And as Rahab the harlot you know, she would have considered herself used goods, you know, only good for one thing. And there would never, ever be any love associated to that one thing. Especially God could never love her. But Rahab, somehow she heard about God and the God of Israel. And there's a beautiful verse that says that her heart melted. Her heart melted as she heard stories about God. And so, as many of you know the story, Joshua sent two spies to Jericho, who actually stayed or lodged at her house. And the king's men came looking for these spies. But she did something that was incredibly amazing. She hid them. She hid them in her home. And in an effort to know God, I believe, because, you know, obviously they you know, talked about God with her and such. So, so this, is, this is a prostitute. This is a hooker. Sorry. In our day, this is not a good lady. You know, this is, this is someone who has a horrible reputation. But this person became, in many ways, not just a hero, you know, to the two spies who she saved, but she was a hero to her own family. Because they spared her family when they came and they tore down, you know, the walls of Jericho. And here's the thing. When she got to know God, she became a new person. She knew she was transformed. She knew that she had been forgiven. And with her new name came a new purpose. And with her new purpose came a new future. 
And God did what, did what no one else could have thought possible. He brought to her a God-fearing man named Salmon. Amazing story. She went on to have a great marriage with this man. And when nobody else would ever have thought that this was possible, God did it. Because she didn't hang on to her label. Some of you today, you know, I believe 85%. So, you know, some of us, some of you, have, have, have bought into some labels that others have placed in you. Some of you did, may this morning, and I'm going to have the Holy Spirit to, to reveal that. There's sometimes we don't see things in our life that we've been told that do not line up with this book, the Bible, and who God says we are. And some of you are there. I'm never going to be this. It's always going to be this way. I'm not good enough. And just like the self-fulfilled prophecy, you know, well, this is what they said I am, so I guess that's what I'm going to be. And you just live it. And it follows you through life. So what God did through Rahab, who married a a God-fearing man, that ex- same extraordinary thing God wants to do in all of us. Do you know that this woman had a son who had a son who had a son who had a son? And sons, great, 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 all the way down to Jesus Christ. You can trace the lineage of Rahab all the way down to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Don't you dare, don't you dare let people Anyone put labels on you. You are not what anyone else says you are. You are not even what you may think sometimes you are because of your past. But you are a new creation. And by the power of Christ, you can get past your past and God will bestow on you a new name. You're not what people called you. That which has held you back, let's let it go. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to let it go. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new person. The old life is gone, gone, and behold, your life is now new. And everyone said, let's pray. Father, this morning I pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that your power, your presence, and your grace And Father, your mercy would overwhelm us today. Your love would overflow in and through our hearts. Father, every label that has held us back, every word spoken that was shameful, any time in our lives, even those that we may not even recognize have affected us, Lord God, we pray in the name of Jesus, by your spirit, open our eyes to see those things. Help us, Lord, because we know that we cannot fix the things that we do not acknowledge. And so bring it to our hearts and, and our minds so that we can be who you have called us to be. Father, every label, Father, every mindset that anyone has, has, has put on us and the way we see ourselves, we no longer want those negative things to keep us from being who you say we are. Help us to know who we are in Christ. Help us to overcome these things that have held us down. And Father, today we recognize that we have a new name, a new purpose, a new future. So empower us by your spirit to break the labels that hold us back. Father, whether we are the youngest in this room or the oldest in this room, Father, do your work in us that we may know your love and know who we are, made in the image of you. Our sins are gone, as far as the east is from the west. Help us, empower us to break these labels and walk in the promise of new life. In Christ's name we pray, and everyone said, amen. This morning, knowing who we are in Christ is remembered every time we come to this table. You know, this table is a table that is, represents the love, the mercy, the kindness of God, and his transforming power. And so as we come to this table, we remember that we are loved. We remember that through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, that the old has passed away and the new has come. 
We are sons and daughters of the living God. This is a table of grace. And God has given us an open invitation to come. And so we come to this table this morning remembering that Christ invites every one of us, that means all of us, who repent of their sin and all who seek to live in peace with one another and therefore let us confess our sin before God. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not done your will. We have rebelled against your love. Forgive us, we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us in the name of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. Glory to God. Let us pray. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you formed us in your image. Father, you breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. And so you delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God. And so, with your people and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join them in saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves, Father, in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Amen. This morning, I'd like to invite those who are assisting in serving, if you would come. And uh, once they are in place, uh, you will be invited to come by our ushers.
to the shadows gone Why should my heart feel lonely And long for heaven and home When Jesus is my portion
I would remind you that next Sunday our district superintendent will be here. And if you have not heard him preach, you need to make sure that you are here. He's a really fantastic person. And uh, that will, that's going to be a very great Sunday. We'll have our potluck after that, after the uh, 11 o'clock service. Let's stand and sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. And now, brothers and sisters, receive this benediction. Go now, as the Lord lives, listen to Christ, and follow him from the places of revelation to the places of mission. And may God shine the light of glory into all of our hearts. May Christ be with you and never leave you. And may the Spirit renew the image of God within all of us as we shed those labels. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.